Now that we've convinced ourselves that atoms exist and looked at some of the fundamentals of general chemistry, we're going to progress to talking about the particles within the atom and then the periodic table, the trends we find within and the overall structure of the table. So to begin, we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence that's out there for the particles that we find within the atom and a little bit about isotopes. Probably for chemical purposes, the most important type of particle in the atom is the electron. The existence of the electron was verified by J.J. Thomson in a classic experiment using electric and magnetic fields and what were called in those days cathode rays, which we now know today are simply electrons. Thomson's experiment involved passing cathode rays through electric and magnetic fields and observing the behavior of the rays under those fields. So for example, under a finite electric field, when cathode rays are emitted, we see a bending of the beam of cathode rays towards the positive end, which indicates that these particles are negatively charged. Similar observations under the effects of a magnetic field indicated as well that these particles were negatively charged, and it was eventually verified through further experiments that they were coming from atoms and they were named electrons. If the atom contains negatively charged particles, electrons, then it seems likely that it also contains positively charged particles, since atoms overall are unlikely to have a finite amount of charge. And it was Rutherford's gold foil experiment that demonstrated the existence of positive charge within the atom and revealed some important spatial insights about the size of the region of positive charge relative to the space taken up by electrons. In the gold foil experiment, Rutherford did something very simple. He took a source of what are called alpha particles, tiny particles that were known to be positively charged, and fired the particles at a very thin layer of gold foil. As the alpha particles approached the gold, gold foil, most of the particles, in fact, passed right through the foil. You can see many of the alpha particles are simply going right past. A few of the particles bounced back. And that indicated to Rutherford that there was a very small, very concentrated region of positive charge within the atom, which he called the nucleus. Of course, we now know that the positive particles within the nucleus are called protons, and we also find neutral particles with the same mass as the proton known as neutrons in the nucleus. This should probably be fairly familiar to you at this point. One thing worth noting about these different atomic particles is their relative masses. So the proton and the neutron have the same mass, it's very tiny, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, but the electron is about 10,000 times lighter than the proton and the neutron. So the proton and, and the neutron are both very massive and concentrated to a very small region of space relative to the electron. For our purposes, as we deepen our understanding of how electrons behave, we're going to treat the nucleus like a point at the center of the atom. It's small enough and so concentrated that we can essentially ignore its volume. The elements may differ in their numbers of neutrons. For reasons that we'll see very shortly, an element is defined by its number of protons, but elements can have different numbers of neutrons. Atoms with the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons are of course called isotopes. Here's an example of the three isotopes of hydrogen. In protium, the most common isotope of hydrogen, the nucleus is simply a single proton with a single electron. In deuterium, we still have a single proton and a single electron, but a, a neutron can also be found in the nucleus. And in tritium, we have two neutrons and one proton in the nucleus along with the one electron. If you look at the periodic table, you'll notice that the atomic masses seem a little bit odd. Many of them are fractional, which seems strange. If, for example, the carbon-12 atom is 12 AMU exactly, then why is the atomic mass of carbon reported on the periodic table 12.01? Isotopes are the origins of these strange fractional atomic masses that we see. The idea is that within nature, there are different abundances of the different isotopes. So the apparent atomic mass of a macroscopic sample is an average over all of those. And so given the average atomic mass of an element and the masses of two isotopes, we can calculate their isotopic abundances. The basic idea there is that the average atomic mass, let's call it n, is a sum 
over all of the individual atomic masses of the isotopes, let's call them m sub i, times their isotopic abundances, which I'll label as a sub i. So the abundance is a percentage of the total number of atoms in a sample. So a is going to be between 0 and 1, since it represents the fraction of atoms within a sample with the mass m sub i. This equation shows us that if we know the average atomic mass and the masses of two isotopes, well then we also know that the sum of the two abundances must be equal to one, and so we can calculate the two ai's from the given m sub i's and the given average atomic mass. We can also calculate average atomic mass given abundances, and the idea here is very similar. We're going to use this same idea that the average atomic mass is just equal to the sum of the product of each abundance times the mass of that isotope. Given the a sub i's and the m sub i's, it's a simple matter of plugging into this formula to calculate the average atomic mass.